Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to FOG and for coming to see us on a Sunday afternoon. We appreciate it. We're here to talk today about, I don't know if you can hear me in the back. Um, good. We're here to talk today and hopefully demystify generative art um, and uh, really talk about this art form that's exploded onto this art scene over the past two years. Um, and perhaps I'd like to first lay the groundwork for our conversation and explain in hopefully layman's terms what, uh, what generative art is. So generative art has actually been around for quite a long time, even predating computers. And when I think about it, uh, what it is, it's a art form where the artist uses code or actually really a system of instructions to generate art. It actually doesn't have to be coded. It could be a, a set of written instructions. Um, so it's a discipline where an artist creates an in, you know, with a computer an autonomous or semi-autonomous system or instructions uh, that then create create art. Um, and you can set a number of parameters, either a lot of parameters or very few parameters, to guide the system in creating that art. Um, and by the way, we are going to leave time, ample time for questions at the end. And there is no such thing as a, uh, a bad question. So please ask if, this is, if any of this is not clear, uh, please ask. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting aspects of this art form, when you use a computer for, uh, for generative art, is that it enables the creation of multiple pieces um, that are all unique one-of-one -one works, but are thematically related based on the parameters that the artist has set. So you can create thematically you know, related collections that might have 100, 200, you know, sometimes 1,000 pieces that are all one of ones, but are all related to each other. And um, you know, in the past two years, since early 2021, we've seen tremendous growth in this, in, this, uh, in this field. A lot of new collectors have streamed in. And believe it or not, in 2021, um, art uh, you know, that, that has been, and, and you know, this form of art has become extremely popular. And one of the reasons is that it has coincided with the rise of the blockchain. So that um, now, when you're creating a collection of art, you can both digitally share it, but ensure ownership. So for an artist, that actually creates, a, enables you to have a career, because you can widely share digital art, but you can also, um, you can actually also create it, make sure it's ownable, there's provenance, there's registered ownership. So this has brought in a huge number of um, collectors uh, to the point where in 2021, uh, art NFTs, which we will d demystify and explain in a moment, um, were actually 4% of the global fine art market in 2021. I'm sorry, in, um, in 2022, after really starting in early 21 or late 2020, really coming from nowhere, reaching a quite, a, quite a large penetration of the market. Um, my, my background, I should have, actually started with is that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been based in San Francisco since um, 1993. Um, and um, I've been working with artists and communities of artists for my entire career. Um, I started collecting generative art in early 21 and I've become a quite a passionate collector. And I would say there are four main reasons why I'm engaged in this space. One is that the medium allows for art that I think is really dynamic and it allows for possibilities that are not otherwise um, available. Um, two, I feel like I can still be an early collector, that I, I'm collecting people who I think will be masters and considered masters in the movement one day. Uh, three, I like the transparency of the market. I really, as a person who enjoys information, I like to be able to look at uh, data and I can see how many people are holding the a collection. I can see who, um, the provenance of the collection. During an auction, I can see a lot of things that are happening. I can see. Uh, I can see the prices, I can see how many people are bidding, I can see all the information I want to about an auction, and for me, transparency is critical. And fourth, um, community. I would say I've been in tech for a while. Um, this is a very welcoming community. It might not seem on the surface that it is, but I can say as, uh, that, that uh, the community values diversity and it welcomes diversity, and I've been, I feel very welcomed. And I've really enjoyed the people I've met, the artists and the collectors in the community. Um, and so I think that's my impetus for share, wanting to share it and, and wanting to, um, and to really wanting to, to push this form forward and, and engaging others in the space. Um, so today we're going to talk about what generative art is, where this, you know, space is going in the future, um, and try to put this into a historical context to have 
everyone really understand the conceptual foundation behind generative art and why this is particularly interesting at this moment in time when one of the biggest existential questions we think about right now is the relationship between man and machine. And uh, with that, I will introduce our two panelists. Uh, Susanna Maybank is the CEO and co-founder at tonic.xyz. Um, she studied the history of art and architecture at Harvard before pursuing a master's degree in the same field at the Courtauld Inst Institute of Art in London. Interestingly, Susanna started as a receptionist at Gagosian after Harvard and persuaded the gallery over time to allow her to expand its online offering and uh, eventually rose to become head of digital at Gagosian. She um, left to pursue her MBA at Stanford, graduated this past spring, but instead of going back to Gagosian, has launched Tonic. Um, and while she was at business school beginning in 2020, witnessed the rise of art NFTs and fell in love with the art being produced. Stefano. Stefano Contiero uh, is a self-taught artist working in Bassano del Grappa, Italy. Did I get that right? Yes. <laughs> um, who developed a strong interest in technology and design, which first led to a career in technology and then later the intersection of his two passions in generative art. So in his work, he explores self-reflection and expression, and we'll, we actually see his pieces behind us, um, uh, through a continuous feedback loop between his subconscious and the system that he's developed. After developing his craft in solitude for many years, he became known for the Framenti and Rinascita collections on the art platform Artblocks, um, which led him to be one of the top 20 NFT artists globally in 2021. In addition to creating digital art, he also explores ways to integrate physical media into his practice. Welcome both. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I'll start with Stefano. Um, I've given a, a quick introduction, but if you could tell us a little bit more about, about your journey. Um, you know, have you always been an artist? Uh, tell us about how you ended up uh, as a generative artist. Yes. Uh, no, I've uh, not always been an artist, actually. It's a realization I arrived at, uh, at the end of 2020. Uh, I've always been a coder, that's for sure. I actually started coding when I was eight years old. Uh, that's a very funny story. Uh, my parents were trying to lock me out of the computer, and I tried to steal the password from my mom. Initially, I was freezing the computer with code, and then I came up with a UI to fish the password out of my mother. And that, that's why pretty much I understood the power of code, the power of uh, creating with tech, and, uh, and also how my parents started supporting my journey with technology instead of trying to limit my screen time. And since that time, it was clear to me that that's what I wanted to do in life, uh, create with computers. That led uh, very quickly to a career in tech and uh, being a software developer. Of course, you understand after a while that's not everything from coding is beautiful. There are a lot of requirement changes, a lot of rules, a uh, lot of demands from clients and so on. And I kind of fell out of love uh, with coding. But then uh, in the meantime, I picked up uh, a great interest in for design, especially UI design and uh, graphic design. And uh, I kept kind of that career. At a certain point, uh, one morning, I literally woke up and uh, said to myself, I want to learn generative art. I bought a book. And after two weeks, I was uh, hooked. And I could not sleep at night because I wanted to, to create generative art. Uh, I felt it was the perfect uh, union between my, my coding passion, but also my, my visual and artistic passion. And, um, I kind of found my my biggest drive to to create with this uh, this craft, uh, and I fell back again in love with coding, and I can't get enough of it. That's great. I think that's terrific. You've been able to pursue your passion. Congratulations on that. Thank you, <laughs> um, Susanna. You come from a traditional art background. What's your journey into this space? Sure. So you did touch on this briefly, but I went to business school in 2020. And while I was there, it really coincided with this meteoric rise of NFTs as they exploded into the collective consciousness. 
I was the token art girl at business school and really on campus. And so I found myself constantly being asked questions. What is this? Why is this happening? Should we care? And so through that, I had no real option but to educate myself. I needed to, to learn, to really understand so that I could give realistic and appropriate answers to these questions. And it was through that process that I discovered the artists, these really incredibly talented, thoughtful um, artists working in the space and fell in love. Um, and then upon graduation, I said, it was a really easy choice at that point. I said, this is the most interesting thing happening in, uh, in creation at this point. Um, there's so, it's certainly the most revolutionary um, movement to emerge in my lifetime, I feel, uh, in the art sphere. And there's such a rare opportunity here to participate and support and be a part of this, I believe, fundamental paradigm shift in how we think about art and creation. And so it was, a, yeah, then it was a really easy decision. I said, yes, lean in. Time is now. Can you, can you um, talk to us a little bit about the role that the blockchain and NFTs played in the rise of the recent you know, rise to prominence of generative art? And particularly explain to the audience what is an NFT, just to, so we can get everybody onto the same baseline here. Sure. Um, long answer, but I will keep this short and quite clear. Uh, Generative art is not a new phenomenon. I'll talk about that more later. Um, but why it has, what has enabled it to rise in prominence is, um, is the blockchain. Suddenly there was a way for digital assets to be made unique, to be sellable. Um, what an NFT is really is a record in a public ledger uh, it is much more secure. It is a shared network that um, is constantly validating itself. And so you can suddenly, for the first time, have a definitive ledger of who owns what, where these assets live. Um, and so even though digital art and computer art has been around for certain longer than the personal computer, this is the first time that it has been made um, globally accessible and uh, transparent for the broader community. And how would you describe what an NFT is? Do you, should I? <laughs> <laughs> One Probably of you. the most difficult question ever. <laughs> uh, I guess it depends. There are many different type of NFTs. Uh, Artblocks, for sure, probably it's the, the most uh, aligned with uh, what we think it's an NFT because it lives entirely on the blockchain. To me, uh, the easiest short answer is a certificate of uh, ownership, authenticity, provenance. Uh, it's a way to finally attribute a digital anything to a person, a provenance, uh, and its history. Great. Great. Um, all right. Well, I think moving into generative art, I guess I would ask you, Stefano, to describe generative art to someone who knows nothing about it, and particularly, can you describe your process of creation? So uh, there are many definitions of generative art. Probably the most uh, common one is a semi-autonomous uh, uh, system that can generate uh, art or uh, anything. My personal and preference is uh, it's a system that creates beautiful, unique, uh, infinite outputs. And uh, my process is very randomic and uh, organic. It has no rule. Uh, it's very driven by my subconscious, by my feeling, by my taste, by my intuition. Usually, it starts with a vision. Uh, it can be anything from uh, going to a beautiful walk, actually. Uh, this is, was inspired by nature. What was the vision? <laughs> what was the vision between? I was one? taking a walk uh, next to my house, and uh, I was observing how flowers, trees, and everything kind of fit together, and kind of the harmonious chaos of nature. And uh, I wanted to try to to capture and replicate that. 
And uh, the easiest uh, way is to sit down in front of a blank canvas and start writing code and uh, say, OK, how can I possibly capture and, uh, and manifest this vision I have? And of course, uh, as every dream, once you start implementing that dream, even in real life, you realize the dream is very different from reality. And this leads to a kind of uh, feedback loop where it's trial and error, and you, you start, and you go on a path, and then you change path, and then you go back to the same path, and then you find a path that you like, and it might be very, very different from the original vision. And it goes on and on and on. One of the, the most powerful things about generative art is that iteration is so fast and so quick, you can literally see 100,000 of outputs in a day. And that's something uh, previous artists with previous technique could not do. So we get exposed to this amount of art, and we almost get desensitized by, by all the amount of art we see. But still, there's like a line thread that uh, we follow. And at a certain point, you, you stop. You look back and say, OK, I'm done. And when you're done, usually uh, you, you observe, learn, and understand what you create. So in this piece that we're looking at back here, what are some of the parameters that we're seeing here? Um, I'm I, I, you know, color, composition, can you talk us through in this piece what some of the parameters are that you set? Yes, for sure. There's uh, probably one thing that drives uh, most of my work. Uh, there's a strong color palette. I curate all, most of my color palettes. Uh, and from there, uh, this specific piece, I'm actually you know, a change. Okay, it's OK. Uh, it actually takes a different mathematical function to simulate uh, brush strokes. And uh, the position is just randomly, the energy, the intensity, the color is just randomly. And then, of course, it's always like a fine balance between uh, finding the right amount of randomness, but still the, amount of, the right amount of control to have uh, a beautiful, pleasing result that's not leaning in either to the, the direction. Uh, it's a spectrum. Sometimes you want more control. Sometimes you want more randomness. Uh, randomness has the advantage of creating more variation, more surprises. But of course, sometimes it's hard to, to harness and control. On the other side, control can really help you create and envision your vision. That's super interesting. And I'm, I'm noticing that your work has a, has a hand feel to it. It feels very much like it's been hand painted or hand drawn. How would you describe to a layperson what's What's the reason for that? Why does it look like it's hand-drawn? Uh, it's a very, very good point, actually. Uh, I always say that my North Star usually is try to create something that looks great in real life, printed. I really like this kind of physical aspect of my work. When I, when I envision anything, I imagine always the, the work existing in a space. But the second North Star is I want people to question themselves what they're looking at. I don't want people to ask themselves, is this created by a human? Is this created by a machine? Uh, what's the technique used? It's an illustration, it's something else. And that's why I spent uh, way more hours than I should probably trying to replicate uh, the tiny nonsenses and uh, imperfection that a human hand can, can create, which is usually very hard to do with uh, with a computer or a machine, because a uh, computer machine tends to be perfect, but we are imperfect, so it's, uh, it's a nice tension. Interesting to hear the beauty of a human is imperfection, right? That's, I have to take that away, think about that. Um, Susanna, when you think about, um, you know, it seems like generative art all of a sudden exploded onto the scene, but you had referenced that there had been a history. Can you talk a little bit about the roots of this movement? Sure. So. Uh, this movement, I think probably one of the great places to start would be the ready-mades of Marcel Duchamp uh, with the fountain where he took a urinal, turned it on its side and signed it. Um, one of his most iconic pieces, he was challenging the idea that the artist's hand and that mechanical skill was required to create art. He was saying, let's elevate the concept, let's elevate the idea, let's elevate the intent. Um, of course, it was met with massive controversy. <laughs> he, the sh it was rejected from the first place he applied. It was, also, um, it was also shut when they finally did exhibit it. It was shut, so it was met with a lot of skepticism. 
but we see this now emerge even more strongly more recently. I think the minimalist and conceptual art movements of the 50s and 60s are where you see generative art really emerge in a closer form to what it is today. You can look at Sol LeWitt um, and his wall paintings where he wrote instruction cards that would be delivered to an installation crew where he was frequently not present and that would be the moment where the work would come to life uh, completely separate from this ideation phase. You can look at a more recent example in Damien Hirst who told his studio assistant Danielle to paint dots on a canvas and never replicate the colors. That simple set of instructions spawned one of the most prolific um, and certainly most iconic collections uh, series in recent memory. Interesting. Well, and also, I suppose you're talking a little bit about, you're talking a lot about physical art. Um, maybe you could talk a bit about the ephemerality and materiality of, art, of generative art. Um, I think it's hard to think about falling in love with a piece of art, perhaps, and for some of us, only being able to see it on our, in a small digital image. Um, you know, I'm curious what you think about like what, what, what could be done with this and um, yeah, I it'll always be a 2D art firm form. I think, um, I have so many thoughts here. I think that firstly, I think a lot of the skepticism that I've heard personally is people don't understand um, the idea of buying something that is digital. If it doesn't have a substantive physical form, what are they really buying? What are they really getting? Um, and I think that emphasis on the value of material is so interesting in the broader context of art history. You think about when canvas emerged in the Middle Ages in the 15th century, at that point, art that was valuable, you think of reliquaries that are made of gold or have precious gems in them. And of course, there was skepticism at that time as well about the canvas. How could this extremely cheap material um, ever be valuable, and now you see canvases selling for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this is not the first time that we've had to address questions of value in materials, um, and it's it's not surprising that that people are a little skeptical. This is new. This is just emerging. I think that what um, what we're trying to do it tonic. I think that there's a lot of possibilities here. The works are digitally native. They are born digitally, but there's really an entire world of possibilities for how they could manifest in the real world. Um, just because the work is digitally native does not mean that it has to remain on that phone or screen that you were talking about. Um, with Stefano, we're exploring high quality prints, there's really an endless possibility. You can print three-dimensionally, there can be projections, there can be tapestries. This is, this is opening an entirely new possibility, realm of possibility with translation and what that could mean. Um, and so now you might even have three ways to experience a work. What's interesting with generative art um, is many of these works, you can they not only record the output, the physical image, but also the code that created it. And so now if you inclu include this third way of experiencing it, it, with one single artwork, you could have the entire system of rules that created it. You could have the physical image that was created, and then you could have this third, uh, the visual image that was created, and then a third digital avatar that you can interact with. So this opens up an entirely new way of, um, of works relating to each other, of how you can experience a single work. Um, so with Tonic, are you, when I, if I bought a piece of a generative art, what am, I, what am I actually buying? And when I buy an NFT, what am I actually buying? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, when you purchase an NFT, um, you are taking ownership of that, uh, of that work that will include uh, frequently the code as well as the image that it creates. 
um, as well as all of the information on that series, on how it fits into the global scheme, on that relationship to the artist, all of that is contained and, um, and captured and recorded on the blockchain. Uh, with Tonic, we will also give you the option of having a physical derivative as well, whether that be a print, a tapestry, really the sky is the limit, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the entire ecosystem really that you're engaging with. Great. So I guess, Stefano, speaking of history, how do you see your, your, your work um, you know, uh, in the long, in, in, how, how do you see it connected to this very long history? Um, and I know that every artist is different. Um, how do you see yourself and generative art fitting into this legacy? So personally, I, as I was, as you were mentioning before, I developed my craft in solitude, uh, a bit in isolation. Of course, I'm familiar with the history of generative art, but I never uh, kind of dove deeper and, uh, and got direct inspiration. I, I try to, to use my life experience, my perception of reality to create art. And this leads to two different, two, two interesting kind of uh, consequences. The first one is uh, I see my work to be a bit timeless or out of the, the history the world is living, but uh, very deep and rooted in my his personal history. So I guess uh, we will, the time will tell how it will evolve. Uh, and uh, of course, the more I, I get influenced by this space, the more uh, I grow as a person and the more that's reflected in my work. I feel for this space, we are, uh, I'm happy to see finally generative art uh, becoming mainstream. Uh, I feel we have immense opportunities to create uh, and use generative art to deliver to people a very different relationship with art, more personal, more emotional, more unique. Uh, the power of generative art, we can create this one single algorithm that can create infinite outputs. That means that every, possibly every human can get a uh, different piece. That means. So are these two pieces in front of us, or behind us, generated from the same algorithm? Yes, uh, it's a very good example. Uh, the color palette is different, uh, but the technique is the same. But it's mathematically pretty much impossible to have the same exact uh, iteration two times. That means that every one of you in this room could have your own personal version of this work, yeah. and you can relate to that in a way that another person could not. So, for example, if we're purchasing your work on Artblocks during a release, you can actually be, you, you would actually be surprised because in that case, the, the art, in the case of art blocks, the art is actually being minted and born for the first time in front of you yes. on the blockchain at the time of the, co the collector's purchasing. Is that right? Exactly. How does that feel as an artist to that moment of um, the sort of release of control, if you will? It's a roller coaster uh, because, uh, first of all, there's always uh, the chance that a bug would pop up uh, that you're not expecting. And then uh, it means uh, a blank canvas in the worst case scenario <laughs> or something that's not uh, aesthetically pleasing. On the other hand, it feels liberating because you're removing yourself from, uh, from the art. You just create this beautiful system that works autonomously. And once you upload that algorithm to the blockchain, uh, the rest uh, will be kind of magic. Uh, the universe, uh, or however you will call it, entropy. But uh, and the more I speak with some of the collectors, uh, it's also kind of create a beautiful effect in the collector where they get to influence the artwork, even if it's just because they are pressing a single button in a single moment. Right. Because the collector is minting and at that time it's creating, and therefore you and the collector are, in a sense, co-creating at the same time. Yes. Okay. And another very interesting thing is that the collector will see the artwork before the artist, which is very unexpected. To be honest, uh, on one of my very last projects, I still have to go through all the means because that project was so intense emotionally for me that I kind of detached completely. So it's out there, but I still have to see the art. Got it. Interesting. Um, Yes, I've enjoyed that very much, where there's a surprise for me as a collector. In some cases, I'll buy, I'll, I'll love a collection, 
and I will stand there next to the artist and we'll watch the art being born in front of us together, which is kind of an interesting experience. Um, Susanna, should we talk at all about the, uh, the elephant in the room, which is, you know, crypto has been in the news a lot lately. There's a lot of, you know, with a lot of, there's been difficult news around the implosion of De in, in, De in the DeFi space, as well as um, I think people, when, when you think of NFT, a lot of people think about cartoon monkeys. How would you respond to, to that? Sure. Well, first I'll start with FTX. <laughs> I think that um, we've all had some schadenfreude and enjoyed uh, the spectacle there. Um, but at the end of the day, that is old school fraud. <laughs> it just happened to be performed in a newer field. Um, but it was old school fraud. That is not anything new. That is not anything specific to blockchain or DeFi. Old school fraud. Um, when it comes to NFTs and generative art, I think that um, that NFTs really, it's a, it's a record mechanism. It's, the, it's a very practical element, but what you can use this for is incredibly wide. Um, at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is art, um, and the NFT is the record of storage. So, so that's the separation. When you think about cartoon monkeys, they have had some really, really high ticket values. Um, so people like to talk about it. It's in the press a lot. Um, but it's fundamentally a separate part of this ecosystem. It's in collectibles. It is, uh, it's different from what we're talking about here. And um, yeah. A different, a different segment. Something. Yeah, it's a yeah. Yeah, fundamentally different segment. Uh, but it is, yeah. It, and it grabs a lot of attention. <laughs> it's interesting, yeah. I see why people are fascinated by it. Um, but I think that what drew me to this space is, yes, of course, the, the excitement around those dollar values attracts people. But um, once you get to know the art and artist, that's when you fall in love. And then you just absolutely go down that rabbit hole. Um, and it doesn't feel quite so foreign anymore. At the end of the day, these are real people with stories and um, yeah and brilliant minds. So, um, uh, Stefano, where do you see generative art moving next? And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the past couple of months of artificial intelligence. And perhaps, you know, when you think about a semi-autonomous or autonomous system, I think people think, okay, this is AI. What's the line between generative art and AI-generated art? So, I feel... Uh the presence of the artist is different, not in the sense of the the amount of the presence, but the time and the the time in which they enter in the process. With uh, generative art, as I intended, which probably is better to be called algorithmic art, the artists create a set of instruction, a very clear set of instruction that are able to take some decision most of the time randomly uh, that influence the output. Meanwhile, with AI, usually the artists uh, train uh, an artificial intelligence to create similar images. And uh, how it works, a generative artist, uh, an algorithmic artist, uh, imagine those instructions and write those instructions. An AI artist usually curate a set of images to train the, that AI. And, um, I feel uh, AI art probably it's a subset of generative art, like algorithmic art is the same subset, it's a different subset. And um, they definitely coexist. And what I get the most excited about uh, the fact that AI art is uh, becoming more prominent is the fact that uh, as generative artists, I have finally the chance to tell a machine and describe my vision to the machine and see them the vision represented in a very practical visual way, and then I can create an autonomous system that tries to replicate a similar vision. And vice versa, I can use my art to influence AI to see what the AI, how the AI interpret my art, and there's this kind of even deeper collaboration possible uh, with an artificial intelligence. They probably... That's helpful. That's helpful. So you see it as... Uh, generative art being the umbrella term, and then you've got AI art and algorithmic art created by an algorithm 
as subsets, which is a helpful Correct. organization of the space. Thank you. Well, what do you think about generally the future of generative art? So I'm very excited to see generative art going back to physical. Uh, I know that a lot of artists are experimenting with uh, murals, for example. Tyler Hobbs uh, definitely creating some murals. A lot of textiles, myself included. Uh, generative art, it's perfect to create uh, any kind of uh, textile. Generative design in general can be generative fashion, can be generative furniture. And, uh, and again, going back to the aspect of personalization, you can have your own unique chair in your place, in your house, where every chair is different but still cohesive together. And you know that no one else in the world will have that type of art uh, or chair or whatever it is. It sounds very exciting from, the, for the, from both a design and an art perspective. So then uh, lastly, I would like to ask both of you, um, community is such an important aspect of this space. Uh, how do people participate? How do, how, how do you see people participating, collectors, new collectors, if one is just getting into the space as a collector? Where, where do you start? How do you participate? And uh, basically, how has, how has community been, fo been forming? I think that um, this is something that is really wonderful about this space. It is incredibly welcoming and uh, open. It's lovely. Also, the engagement with the artists is so much higher um, than in at least my experience in a more traditional gallery setting. Um, I think that there are two, many ways that this can work, but I think one is um, there's an online discourse almost all the time. It's happening on Discord, it's happening on Twitter. Um, even in that, you can interact directly with the artists. But um, more importantly is to get in person at events like this, at um, at dinners, at cocktail parties, at a bar. Um, the community is really interested in coming together and supporting each other. And, um, and I think that's something really important that we have to preserve, even as more people enter this space. We want everyone to feel um, excited and energized and invigorated by, by each other and by their shared love of uh, this art and these artists. Yeah, I can second that and add, uh, it's incredible how a passion that was a niche and it was uh, probably a bunch of uh, coders nerding out about ways of using code to create something different, uh, kind of got so much attention from so many people and brought together a lot of passionate collectors, artists with so much love and, uh, and a truly authentic passion for something that's incredible. I got to meet incredible people that are even here on the stage uh, and uh, my new best friends are in this space. And it's incredible how everyone is supporting each other and just rooting for, generally, for the movement. Agreed. All right, we're gonna turn it over to the audience for Q&A. Um, okay, let's see, I think I saw you first, so go ahead. Let's see, I'm gonna pass some microphones around. Thank you for sharing and lovely to um, learn about your work and uh, the, the project. So I have two qu quick questions. One is for uh, Stefano. Um, so I was wondering what is your visual inspiration and uh, do you use any visual input uh, through the technical process? And besides uh, generative art, do you also practice like with your hand as an artist? And I was also curious about from the both of your, the three of your observation, um, how is the community open to collaborations? Uh, for example, collaborations between a traditional medium artist and an engineer. Thank you. Take, take the first one, Stefano. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what you have seen, and usually in my practice, everything is code. I don't use any input at all, just my imagination and my experience, I guess. Um, I don't really, uh, I'm not an artist, meaning I'm an artist, I feel like an artist, but I, I'm not traditional in the traditional sense an artist. Uh, I used to like painting, but I, I understood very quickly that I get so involved with the, the canvas and the material and everything that gets too much and uh, the result is not great. So it's, uh, it's more uh, just code. 
Sure, and then when we talk about or think about collaborations within the space, I think it's, I know that it's becoming much more common. If you look at Pace and their work with art blocks, you can see some really incredible um, traditional artists, quote unquote, I really hate using that word, I'm sorry. But um, you can see some really talented painters explore the space. Uh, Loi Hollowell is an incredible example. Her work, Contractions. Um, and Jamie Derringer. And Jamie, who is excuse sitting in the me, front Jamie row. Derringer, who's in the front row, um, who has been a long time uh, traditional artist, again, hate that word, um, but has been creating for almost 20 years, um, began to explore digital manipulations of works a few years ago and is releasing her first generative collection on the 31st. Um, so I think this is a tool that can be used to expand um, how artists who are, uh, who have based their practice in other media, how they can explore this new way of creation, how they can use this to expand their practice, to look at their central themes in new ways. Um, but I think, if anything, we'll see so much more of that going forward. Do you want to go next? Thank you. Thank you. Fascinating. My question is to go deeper a little bit so I understand code generated art. What about the ratio as you experience now on NFTs in terms of what you call traditional or photography or other things in line with what actually is uh, now becoming more of a I wouldn't say popular, but what would you say in terms of marketing? What would be the ratio between generated art, traditional painting art, and photography? I, I couldn't quite hear the question. The ratio between um, the sorry of like where we see this moving in the future. The ratio of um, the ratio of uh, on your platform. Yep. What it would be the ratio of those that are doing generated art, yep. those that are doing uh, Photoshop, whatever kind of, uh, and photography. Um, so at this point we are, uh, the entire offering will be digitally native uh, generative art. We may expand in the future if something really incredible, I was certainly interested in exploring AI, um, but our foundation is trying to find a way to, uh, to create a bridge between the digital and physical worlds and so that natively digital quality of generative art, that authenticity to the medium of this is created on, this is created with an interaction with the machine, this is completely authentically um, digitally native, that is really important to us. Yes. Well, and also, I think there are going to be collaborations possible, right? You were yes. saying. Uh, you can, yeah, there will be collaborations where artists can work with a creative coder to help them realize these projects. So there will be no necessarily barrier to entry for who can participate, um, but it, it will be digitally native work. Who's next yes, here? I'm next. Uh, so I wanted to mention, I'm really sorry, I don't remember the name of the artist. Um, she's the one uh, that was really the one behind Duchamp's urinal. Yep. So to first give her credit and then to bring Thank out... Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. She did commit suicide, unfortunately, when she was starving. But um, that's another point. The point is that Duchamp and others did quite well. That's another point. The main point is it's about fake news. You yourself right now brought up a fact that is not a fact. But just let me continue, because it wasn't Duchamp, and it's just coming out in the recent years. And what you say is that you can prove the provenance and who did the coding. But the question that I'm asking is copyright. Right now, even as what you call a traditional artist, but I considered in my time an avant-garde artist, that was important to us. 
as you know, anybody can resale our art and we don't get any percentage. So now here, in this day and age, you basically have said copyright doesn't exist. Because what you're saying is that you can prove the provenance. But you forget that technology is not going to be the same today. And I'm going to ask you all to speak to this. It's going to change fast, faster than you and I can know. So how are you going to prove that provenance? You can't today, but someone else is going to be able to hack it and change it, and please speak to that. And how are you going to change the art world today? First off, thank you for calling out that, uh, that there was a Duchamp, that there was someone else behind that work. I think it's incredibly important to um, to give voice to that and to make sure that people are properly credited. Um, I want to make sure that I fully understand um, the question in regards to copyright specifically. I think it's incredibly important to be honoring copyright um, and to be extremely clear with uh, the legalities of all of this. A artist selling a image does not necessarily grant copyright to the owner of that image. The artist retains that. Um, there is also uh, all of the moral rights to that artwork um, belong and should belong and retain with the creator. I think that's really important. And, and this does not actually ch challenge that, or it should not. We have to be extremely clear in these contracts to make sure that everyone understands exactly um, where those moral rights and that copyright retains. Um, when it comes to the immutability or sort of what happens in the future of this, um, this is something that I care about a lot. I was a medievalist in a former life, and the book emerged and was around until today. <laughs> that is a, um, that is a, a masterpiece. That is an incredibly solid and reliable connection. Um, and storage of information, and I, I think that's really important. The floppy disk is no longer around. If you want to use a floppy disk, that's really hard. Um, what is so wonderful about the blockchain is through this decentralized um, platform, through all of these different computers who are verifying, who continue to verify this chain, um, as long as one person is willing to beat the drum, uh, it can continue. This shared uh, dispersion of responsibility for this um, makes it a safer place for all of us to exist. Um, I am not saying that there is never going to be anything to challenge that. I think that, um, that it just means being extremely thoughtful and extremely careful moving forward to be respectful to the artists, to make sure that you are protecting them and their legacy. Um, as well as the collectors. So I think it's an ongoing conversation um, and r a really important point to bring up, and thank you. I will touch very briefly on the copyright thing. I feel NFTs do not solve or remove the need for copyright. Actually, they just make it easier to prove that copyright was uh, violated, meaning that there's nothing that stops you from taking one of these images, creating another copy on the blockchain under your name but it make it easier for people to verify that that was not produced by my wallet, signed by me mathematically, and authentic because it was created by me. I feel NFTs are just another tool to make copyright more secure, but uh, it's a whole different topic, the need of copyright. I'm the first advocate for the need of copyright. And we have seen already, even in our space, some people trying to violate copyright, try to make money off of other artists and so on. But fortunately, given that this community is so supportive and so attentive and start to get educated about how things work, it's easier to spot those bad actors and eliminate them and call them out. Second row, OK. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, let's say I love this artwork, right? But how do I get it in my house? I'll print it for you. <laughs> but let's say I wanted to get it like painted, right? So there's like a couple different mediums that would like NFTs. Totally. It's still missing out, like right? If I spend five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars on a painting, 
right? I want it that big yeah. in my house. Can you contract with somebody to... This is the really incredible thing about this space is because it's a digitally native image, if you want it in your house and you have a space that's... You want it to be tiny, you that can big. do that. You want it to be this big, fine. Take up a whole wall. You want it to take it up the whole like wall, that. fine. There are so like many that ways too. that these can be translated. You can do... There are plotter options that involve not just... Um, graphite, but paint. There is truly an unlimited, there's 3D printing, there's, uh, you can 3D print with such incredible substrates now, like it, the But future, Susanna, what, what, are you actually going to print it for him? Like I am actually going to print it for so you. So what does yes. that, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Anyone who purchases um, work on tonic at least, um, all of the work will have the option for a physical manifestation. Um, in the beginning, that will be prints, but it will explore, uh, it will explore more. And so that means that it's token gated. So only the owner of that NFT um, has the ability to print the print to receive one of these works. But if you do own it, yes, everyone will have the option to say, I want it this big. I want it with a black frame. I want it with a white frame, whatever you want. Um, yes, you can live with it in your home. We will make it as easy as humanly possible for you to do that. Okay, cool. So like one day if I ordered it, I, I would get like a big ass TV. You know, it'll, yeah, it, it could be a TV, but you could also just, you could have a, there's some detail that is only possible with physical, or at least right now is only possible with physical printing or physical manifestations through plotter, et cetera. Um, and so do, you'll have that. I do have to say, I agree that in digital form, really big, it's exciting. <laughs> so I agree with you. One day digital, right? Yes. Digital display. One day. I just don't know if I'm ever going to have my entire house digital. I think it'll always be a mixture for me. Yep. Yeah. And then last, last question. Um, what's the difference between Tonic, OpenSea, and then Magic Eden? Sure. So uh, first off, we are a primary marketplace. Um, so we work directly with the artists to develop uh, and release these collections. Uh, highly curated. That would be uh, some big differences. OpenSea does do primary, but also releases secondary works. It is a much larger player. If you come to us, it's gonna be much tighter, um, much more curated, and um, a little bit easier to consume for people just getting into the space. OpenSea is a little bit like a eBay that absolutely sells everything. Like literally everything is for sale um, with no, not really, it's not meant to be a curated experience. So everything is for sale secondhand. I think this gentleman in the blue right here, go ahead. He's been, his arm is up and up for a while. Yeah. Thank you very much. A great presentation. You know, I think we could, we would collectively agree that great art stretches our imagination, you know, illuminates things from different perspectives and also may be a little provocative. You segmented the space uh, in algorithmic art and AI. Both of these uh, uh, generative art forms have uh, to respect boundaries. Algorithmic art, the boundaries of code and compilers. AI, the boundaries of taste, convention, law, and so forth. Doesn't that limit the creative process? Do you want to ask Should this? I? Yeah. Uh, yes, no, I don't know. It depends from the artist, I guess. Uh, but I can ask you the same question. Does the camera limit the imagination of somebody? Uh, it's just a medium, like uh, a pen, a brush, or a uh, sculpture. And I understand that uh, there's something else, especially on AI art, because you give up a lot of control. But on the other hand, uh, it's kind of an extension of the imagination because you do not know what you, to expect. You put some inputs and you get some outputs, and maybe the outputs are wilder than your imagination. I don't, I don't want to take this too far, but the process between inputs and outputs is severely constrained by the development of the AI. And these constraints take numerous forms. I mean, it's as we as we speak, you know, OpenAI is developing uh, DAL E2 and DAL E3 and 4. And if you just read through the content policy, there are a dozen of constraints. So I'm, I would make the argument that this is a severe limitation on the creative process. Thank you. Who's next? Hi. 
Thank you. Um, I really appreciate just the work you've been doing in the NFT space, and I've followed also Heretic for a while. Um, I, I've been exploring more NFTs and uses with public domain, older works of art, and working with museums. I, I'm curious. I'm curious if you've been um, also exploring how to engage, you know, older public domain works of art um, in the NFT space. I'm curious about what you've seen or what you considered in your own work. I, we have seen this, yes. I think Uffizi was an early player in this where they started to tokenize um, works from their collection. I think that's a, and I'm gonna speak for myself personally, not on behalf of the company here, but I, I think it's a really interesting and sticky spot because uh, works in these collections, uh, the ownership structure is really complicated. For one, if it's in public domain, the artist has passed, so they don't have a say anymore in what happens to their artwork. Um, and I think that is, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I think that's really a tricky spot to be in. That said, we also do put these on postcards and T-shirts. So, so we have already made a lot of those decisions on behalf of these artists. Also, the uh, issue of the, again, these works came to be in the collection through a donor or something. So there are also these legal implications that I, um, that I personally don't know enough about to to speak to, but I would be interested in figuring it out. I do think that um, that there's a huge amount of new interest swelling and generating um, around the art and creative space uh, because of NFTs um, and because of, of generative art. And so I, I still think that there is a massive opportunity there for you know these older institutions to galvanize a new, um, interest base to really excite people around this. So I, I, I don't know, I guess is, I, I have concerns, I have thoughts, and I'm not sure, and I would need to speak to someone who's really um, embedded in the space. It, Excuse yeah. me? Exactly. Yeah, it's democratization. Exactly. Yeah, these, this art is very viewable, which is terrific, very viewable, um, and that does democratize. I think that's true. And I, I have spoken to multiple people involved in curation for museums, and I know that people are building their, you know, the NFT collections of museums are being built now. So the questions really are, we're so early, who will be considered the masters of the movement? Um, I, my, friend, my collector friends and I, who collect NFTs, sort of have this running conversation behind the scenes as to who we think will end up in the museum collections. But we know that, that some, of, some of the people that we're very familiar with will. Hopefully, hopefully Stefano too. <laughs> but I think that people are pioneering right now. This is a historic part of what, it's a very historic uh, moment. And, um, you know, and you'll start to see, you know, you'll start to see this happening in the next few years. Um, yeah. Um, I'm a college student studying um, studio arts and like computer science. I was just uh, curious about your perspective and how like generative art is going to shape how art is going to be taught in schools in the future. Just in terms of like how um, are there like changes we might hope for to like better equip and like empower artists in this sort of like emerging landscape. I think there's a uh, sorry. I keep jumping in. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity here in two ways. I think that this is one way also to, to introduce coding earlier um, and, and find a way to get people excited about that and an education tool on both sides. This is a creative medium, but it's also a technical medium that you can use. I think that getting kids creative coding as early as possible would be a, a great thing for a number of reasons. So I hope that happens. Actually, the other I was thinking the other way around, getting all the kids who are interested in coding, drawing them into the world of art. Yep. Because I think it's really important to keep, uh, you know, creating generational interest in the arts. And this is a very, very good way to, to bring more kids in, um, and including college students in. I might be biased, but uh, creative coding is the most fun and uh, easy way to learn how to code. 
there are no rules. It just needs to output something. In the, oh yeah, Hi. go ahead. I was really intri intrigued by what you said about how you see the co or you see the art coming for the first time with when when you're uh, first exhibiting. So it reminded me a lot of like dance or theater, something that's live, uh, but not. That's a great point. An yeah. interaction between audience and artist. Correct. So I just I guess my my biggest question about that because there's so many is more how how do you practice how do you rehearse you don't <laughs> meaning that of course when you create generative art you see a lot of outputs so the more outputs you see the more confident you are that nothing unexpected happens but of course always something unexpected happens yeah. and on the more human side uh, to be honest is one of the hardest thing for me personally uh, even if I'm not together with the people when they see the art for the first time, I know that there's somebody getting an artwork, something I created and looking at it before me or uh, with me. And uh, it's challenging. And uh, recently uh, we had a show where uh, this whole uh, reveal process was live and uh, the artist was standing next to the collectors. And that was one of the most intense things I ever done in my life. And uh, I was supposed to be in that room probably 50, 60 times with 50, 60 different people, but I managed to do 10, and then it was too much. I needed to step back because it was too intense as a... Stefano, if, do you ha how do, do you communicate with collectors and how can people find you if they wanted to stay in touch with you or somehow follow what's going on or communicate with you? Or maybe not communicate, but like, do you have an Instagram handle or what do, what do you do out there? I do. I don't okay. use much social. I should be better well, at What is those. your address on social? On, uh, on Instagram? Stefan underscore Contiero. My uh, first name uh, with my last name. It should be pretty easy to find. Okay, great. And, yeah. Okay. One last question. All the way in the back there. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm interested about the legal implications about this. So first, one assumption and then my question, right? So my assumption is that if I buy an NFT, I buy the right to have a copy of that image, right? So if I like to, if I want to print it, I can print it and hang it in my wall. I could print it in a T-shirt, um, but the author has the copyrights, right? So parallelly to the creation of the image, you register the copyright. I buy the NFT, so I do this assumption. And then my question is, how do you enforce uh, any copyright okay. violations. I'll, I'll right? take that. I can take okay. that one. So every single NFT, this is what people don't say, but really you should do. You should look at the, what, what the fine print is associated with your NFT. So every, because the artist can set their own copyright terms for that collection, and it can be different for each collection and each artist. So actually, it, it depends is the answer, unfortunately. It, it depends what the artist has set as copyright terms for that collection. And the other problem is that, and this is the part that, that is not great, but it depends on which platform you're buying from, if you're buying from a, a reputable gallery or not, how much of that copyright, uh, the terms will be revealed or not. So some of, sometimes an artist says it's fine to print it, sometimes they may say it's not okay to print it. And moreover, when you, um, sometimes the high res file is available and sometimes it's not. So you could print perhaps a, you know, a tiny little, you know, if you want a high, clear, high, 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 very clear image, you wouldn't be able to print something of this size by right-click saving the image and trying to print it, right? It won't print like that. The file is not available to you, not necessarily. And again, I will just say it depends. So the, I, I'm sorry that it's not more clear, but it really depends collection by collection. There's the need of the copyright again. Uh, it just uh, it makes it more explicit. But uh, it really depends. It really depends on the artist. And uh, of course, you can infringe copyright if you want. But uh, that's a whole different topic. There's a handful of really high quality, high caliber uh, galleries that you can trust, where you can look at the fine print is very well divulged. Art blocks, bright moments, tonic, others that are going to be very held to a very high standard. So I'd be careful. I'd be I'd be careful. I guess is my point, and yeah.
That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. I think there's, uh, did you want to say something? And I used to buy talent, and the copyright, and this and that. It was like that before. Now the, it's still the same thing for the normal art, for an artist. You can only buy, when you buy, a, um, how do you say, a tableau, a, a painting. When you buy a painting, you are not, you do not have the copyright. Right, right. It was like yeah. that before. That's right, okay? yeah. And now it's the same thing, except it gets even more complicated. Because yeah. for instance, for photography before, you could buy a photo and think that you had the copyright to the photo. You don't, you have the photo. And all depends on how many uh, different kinds of paper it has been, yeah. um, how do you say, printed, okay? So you can have one photo that was on this sort of paper, and somebody else can have exactly the same photo, number one, on another sort of paper. So all that is very complicated, and it's getting even more complicated yep. with the... With this, with, yeah, with absolutely. That. Yeah, I think it's just that really there, we haven't solved any kind of copyright problem with this genre. I think ownership and copyright are clearly two very, very different things. And we have to separate who owns the piece and who owns the copyright of the piece. And this does not necessarily solve any copyright problems. The problems you're saying are the same, right? And it's gotten even more complicated. I agree. Yeah. Agreed. Hi. Um, I'm a 3D artist and recent graduate. I can, was you hold it up? can you speak up a tiny bit? It's on, but just speak up a little. Sorry, I can't hear you. Um, I'm a 3D artist and recent graduate, and you've been speaking. You've been speaking a lot about community and how welcoming is it. Um, what would be your recommendations for 3D artists to get in touch with this community? How do you get in? Where do you start? <laughs> yeah. So I think. Um, I, like not to be too reductive of it, but join the discords, join the um, just join the conversation, start talking. There are in-person events that you will hear about through all of these channels. Uh, follow people on Twitter. If you're interested in participating as an artist, um, go to our website. <laughs> Um, because we will be accepting artist submissions um, or just reach out. People are really welcoming. They respond to emails. Um, I would also love to talk to you after. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I think it's really just leaning in, joining the conversation, um, and starting to talk to people. And they're, it's just a really welcoming, great community. Very open. These are not necessarily gated communities. Um, they are, there are public forums where you can enter that are active and engaged. Um, it's not, yeah, it's not necessarily a walled garden. All right, I think that that is it. Thank you so much for staying with us. Thank Appreciate you. it. And we'll be around here if you want to come chat. Thanks Thank so you. much. <laughs>